Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Hot Topic video. If this is the first time you're watching me, welcome. My name is Marcy Melzer, and I am an intuitive speech and language pathologist. And it's my mission to help as many parents as possible teach your late talking children how to use the words they need to share their wisdom with the world. And when I use the term late talking, that just means that every child who has communication inside of them, and if you are hoping and wanting to facilitate natural verbal communication, then they're just not talking yet. So that's why I call them all late talkers. So welcome today to this week's hot topic where I'm gonna be talking about how to find the root cause of late talking, which is actually the most important first step for families. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not a one and done kind of thing. Some parents have to do investigating for a long period of time or repeated kinds of investigation to really find out what's going on, but they learn things along the way because they do the right kind of investigation. So what I'm gonna talk to you about on this video today is three steps that you need to do um, to really figure out the cause of what is, you know, the root of the problem that's causing your child to be late talking. And it's different for every child. While many children have similar things going on, most of the time there are unique situations, circumstances that are happening um, either internally or externally in your child's environment. And um, then when you understand what those things are, that's how you can start to address what, how it goes. So, oops, excuse me, nose itches. All right, so what I'm gonna start with, the first step is that you need to understand what um, is necessary for verbal language development. So when you realize what your child needs, like what kind of abilities, skills, and physical structure, what kind of circumstances have to be present for verbal language learning, and I'm gonna give you five of them, okay? The first thing that must happen, and this is what you need to do is, when you understand what is necessary for communication, then you can see in your child what might be lacking, which one of these things is broken, for lack of a better word, just to say, you know, which one of these kinds of areas, situations that are necessary for language development, could be present in your child. And the first one is, hey, Brianna, thanks for joining me, um, is to understand what's necessary for learning language. And the five things that you need to have, five of the, of the things, um, the first one is a clear auditory signal. So that means that your child has to be able to hear people talking clearly. So their ears have to be working well enough. There can't be fluid, there can't be infections, there can't be problems with their ears. They have to be working well enough for them to hear verbal speech. And they also have to um, be able to relate experiences to words. So they have to be able to pay attention to those words and understand how they connect with the things that are going on in their lives. And then the next thing that they that they need, a child needs to develop verbal language, is they have to be able to understand that words actually have meaning. So they understand that words relate sort of generally to their environment, but then they also have to understand that an individual word means a certain thing in the language that you're teaching them. So. And then they have to be able to access those words and use them for their communication purposes. So they have to be able to remember the words and they have to be able to find them in their memory banks and then use them appropriately when they need to use spoken language. And then the fifth thing that you need to have to be able to develop good natural verbal language is the ability to respond 
to others communication and have back and forth communication exchange and that's how you learn to use new language by using it in experiences it kind of like riding a bicycle you learn to use it by riding it more and more and so to learn natural verbal language you have to have ability to practice it right and and use that kind of response when others communicate to you to practice talking so those are the five things that a child must have in place this, those circumstances that have to be in place and so it with each one of those five things a plethora of things could be going wrong so it, a child may not hear an auditory signal because of ear infections or glue ear or some structural problems or maybe they're not exposed to an auditory signal so there's lots and lots of reasons that that one component of what is necessary for language learning can break down it's the same with relating experiences to words if a child is used to focusing on experiences without talking going on in the environment or without being able to hear talking going on in the environment, then they're not going to relate their experiences to words. They're going to use more visual cues or tactile cues or learn different ways to understand their experiences and not relying necessarily on speech or language to help them understand their world. And that's so a lot of times where communication breaks down for kiddos because they, they don't know how to relate experiences to to actual words because they get so used to relating to things non-verbally. Um, and then understanding what words mean is the vocabulary learning of it, you know, where kids know that this is your nose and a phone is a phone and a water is water, things like that. They have to understand that vocabulary has meaning and, and, and there's a system in place to use it so every time you look at this thing it's called nose and even if it's a cat's nose or a dog's nose or your mommy's nose or your nose that's all still a nose just that kind of systemic learning is necessary and a child who's not focused on using words at all isn't going to be able to learn to understand that those words have actual meaning um, in in a language concept they might learn that words represent things like if they hold out their hand and say please they might get something or if they point or grunt or make up a word things like that um, and then accessing and using words that's a little bit more complicated thing to um, try to figure out what could be wrong but it, it often happens that when kids really don't understand that words have useful meaning for them then they're not going to know how to access them to use them because they just aren't functional they're using other things to communicate like like plowing you around the house and pushing things and and bringing you objects or pointing or gestures or sign language or pecs or something like that they just don't really get pre get you know used to understanding how to access spoken word vocabulary for their main communication because they're using something else um, and then they also many kids have trouble with responding to others in a communication standpoint they um, they use communication just to sort of get their needs met but they don't share experiences using language they may not share many experiences at all um, in their life and that could be one of the things and of course that is a necessary component so the first step in really understanding the root of what's going on with your late talkers communication and what you know what's the root of the problem of their late talking you have to think about which of those areas are lacking in your child as you're trying to teach them language because most parents are trying right you're out there doing things to try to get your child to talk and where is it breaking down do they not understand you can they not hear you can they um, not relate to the words can they not understand what the words mean um, maybe they're not even listening and focusing on you maybe they can hear but they're not listening and focusing because of attention issues maybe they're distracted by of physical development there's all kinds of things that can go on and that's why we're going to move to the second step so first of all you're going to really start to break down for your own self as you try to teach your child which of those areas are the most challenging for you like what is it that's that's breaking down 
And then step two is you want to start to look at the systems necessary in your child to make those things happen, all those things happen. So then when you start to look at the actual systems for communication, these are some of the systems that you must evaluate, that you must have evaluated. So their sensory systems, their vision and hearing, both of those things, if either one of those is out of whack or not functioning properly, it's going to affect language because spoken language relies on children looking at people talking in addition to hearing them because they have to relate and understand that the language is coming from a person so that they know people can talk. It's like you teach your child to brush their teeth because that's what people do. You teach them to talk because that's what people do. If a child can't see your face or they're not used to focusing or or even if vision is challenging for them, they're going to be distracted by that vision problem and not focus on communication because it's way more challenging to not be able to see something or hear something and live in the world. You're going to be working on focusing on compensating for those problems as a child. They're going to be working on trying to compensate for not being able to see and see and not being able to hear by using one or the other of those senses on overload. If they can't hear, they're going to be trying to use, do things visually. If they can't see, they're going to try to listen and focus and feel and do a lot of tactile kind of learning, right? So the first thing you have to do is make sure that those systems, those sensory systems are evaluated. I'm talking about just sensory perception. So if your child is hypersensitive or hyposensitive, those are the things that you want to really start to evaluate because unless you can hear and focus on another person talking, you're not going to be able to learn spoken language. So sensory systems, that's the first thing you need to look at. And then you need to look at the motor and physical systems of your child. If there's something that's broken down in another area that could cause them to have development, then those things have to be addressed. So if your child is having trouble walking and you're spending all your energy on them, that's what happened to one of the families in my program, a very late walker because of lots of motoric kind of stuff, prematurity, all kinds of things, Ce uh, cerebral palsy, cows, all different kinds of motor issues that often get focused on very heavily before language. And you have to really work on um, making sure that you understand what's going on with all of your child's motor systems. So watch them. If they're having trouble doing something, walking, manipulating toys, reaching, grabbing, moving around, crawling, all of those motoric problems can cause late talking because it's all connected, right? So you really want to make sure that those motoric issues are done. And then there's physiological problems that could be happening. And this is, it opens a big, big issue with, um, you know, all kinds of intervention that parents are doing to look at your child's physiology. But the first thing you need to make sure is that they have good structures. So first look at the things you can see. Like I said, vision and hearing are very evident. You can see them behaviorally. And um, when, you, when you have physiological problems with your mouth and throat system, then you're probably also going to have experienced problems with feeding at some point. So watch your child or pay attention to how your child's feeding development has been. There could be a lip or tongue tie that was undiagnosed or that's not going on and that can cause kids to be late talking. Um, and in those issues may have caused breastfeeding issues or they are causing eating issues. You see your child having other oral motor difficulties. They can't blow difficulties like that. If there's some kind of structure in the things that you can see. Obviously observe your child having difficulty with that have to do with their mouth. Breathing, snoring, um, you know, all those ear, nose, and throat issues have to be working well enough for a child to have good speech. So physiologically, you're going to check the systems that have to do with your head and neck area first. 
okay? Because any of those things are really going to have problems. Now, if your child has all kinds of other behavior issues going on, then you have to really then start to look at attention and learning. But first, you have to do those physiological issues because any of those physiological things that I talked about already, sensory problems or physiological problems, motor, you know, like I said, problems with your structures of your talking head and neck structures, those things can, um, can unless you get them remediated, it's going to be tricky for your child to learn language and they're going to start to learn behaviors to compensate for them. So, um, so those things are really important, but, and, and they're always, always, always going to cause your child to have difficulty with attention and learning because they're always going to be trying to compensate for those physiological problems. So it's very important that you get those physiological problems taken care of first. Okay. And, then you need to focus on attention and learning. So remember, for all of you who are out there thinking, you know, my child's late talking because of an autism diagnosis or because of an apraxia diagnosis or because of an expressive language diagnosis, it's not about diagnosis. It's about looking at all the things that your child can do because a diagnosis of autism happens to one in 40 kids, the CDC says now, and they're all different looking, right? They all, I mean, what, if you look at five kids and if you've got 40 of them in front of you they all look different and it's important for you as a parent to understand what that is not the autism but what looks like autism what is it about your child that caused that diagnosis to be given to them that's what you need to be focused on not the diagnosis at all so what you need to be looking then at is their attention and learning after you take care of those other physiological things, then you want to start to look at their attention and learning. And the way that you can get these things evaluated is first, like I said, at this first level, you need to be thinking about how is your child learning from you or not? What kinds of things have you been able to teach your child? Can you teach them to play peekaboo? Can you teach them to brush their teeth? Have you potty trained them? You know, and it doesn't matter how old your child is, you've been teaching them things since they came out of the womb. You've been teaching them to say goo goo gaga when you look at them in their face. All the stuff that you've taught them since they were infants, you need to look at that and what kinds of things have been challenging for you to teach them. And that's where you identify your problem areas, right? So attention and learning has to be evaluated at first by you so that when you do go see a professional, you have something to tell them. You have understanding of what's going on with your child. So this second stage, the first two stages of this recommendation for this video today are all about you looking at your child before you find. And in the third stage, we're going to talk about professionals. But the first two steps are all about you looking at your child yourself to really understand because the only way to understand the root of their problems is to understand them from the base base level and the things that you watch them do or challenge them every day. So the next thing that you need to look at is their self-help. What are they doing for themselves, right? What have they figured out on their own? Um, have they learned how to communicate with you non-verbally? Have they learned to just get things on their own instead of asking for you? Have they learned to use certain words that mean a lot of things because they're the only words they have? Those are the things you need to evaluate. How is your child looking out for themselves? How are they improving in their independence or not? Maybe they still need you to do everything or maybe you haven't taught them self-help things. You need to look at that situation. Is your child doing things like other children that you see, like your other children? Um, not that you compare them, but you, like I said, you're the one teaching your child so that if you've taught child A and they didn't learn it and child B is learning it or vice versa, you have to kind of figure out why that is because your teaching is the same. It's your kids that are different. And that's how you start to understand what's going on with them. All right, and then the next thing you need to do is look at their social interaction. So you need to see how are they communicating with you? How are they communicating with other people they know in your family, out of your family? Maybe they see your parents frequently, but they live up the street or across town, or maybe they don't, then 
don't see your parents hardly ever and they react differently with them? How do they do with peers at school or daycare? Um, how do they do with their siblings? And you want, really want to evaluate where, in what social circumstances your child is successful and where they have their challenges, all right? And then you have to look at their overall wellness. So if your child is ill, you know, many kids are late talking as a result of toxin exposure of one kind or another. Um, there are a lot of parents who say their kids are late talking due to toxin exposure from vaccines. There's lots of kids who are being tested by doctors and identified with that. So there are many different kinds of things for you to evaluate before you go down those roads before you even start to talk to those doctors about your child's overall wellness. Is your child sick frequently? Are they only sick at certain times of the year? You know, is it only happening in winter or is it only happening in summer? Is it only happening in hay fever time? Um, when do you see increases and decreases in behavior in your child? Um, when do they get stomach problems? Um, are they extremely picky eater? Um, do there certain things aggravate or frustrate them? Um, consistently. You know your child best and their overall wellness is something that you need to be monitoring and looking at and paying attention to. Because when we move into step three and you start to talk to other professionals, you're going to want to have the information. So if you're just joining this video now as, I, as I'm on live and you, you'll want to go back and watch the replay from the beginning because you really need to do steps one and two to evaluate your child's um, what they have going on as far as their understanding of what's necessary for learning language and then looking at the systems that are required in their physiological selves to be able to do those things, all right? And then when you identify the, the areas where it's breaking down, um, maybe it's the sensory system. I'm not sure if he's seeing, I'm not sure if he's hearing. Then you're going to want to find professionals to evaluate that sensory system. So if you're concerned about vision, you need to go to a uh, pediatric ophthalmologist. If you're concerned about hearing, you need to go to a pediatric audiologist. And I'm saying pediatric because testing sensory systems, ears and hearing and vision is tricky stuff, especially for late talkers because they're not, oh, they don't always have the great attention to be able to sit and drop a block and or raise their hand when they hear a beep. You know, they have to use all kinds of interesting evaluation tools. And those folks, who are used to working with kids, little kids, they know how to do that evaluation to get really good results because you want to go to somebody reputable, of course, who's going to give you very accurate results and then recommendations as far as interventions. So if your child does have a hearing test and they find out something wrong, you want to make sure that you get a good recommendation for the intervention to correct that problem. Same with vision, same with your ear, nose, and throat system. If you think that there's a tongue tie, if you think that there's a concern about any of that, then you can see a dentist or an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and they can do evaluation about that. A lot of parents will post pictures of their kids in a Facebook group or you know whatever, but the only real way to know these physiological things is to get the kind of testing that professionals who focus on those areas do. And make sure that when you do go to that professional um, to get your evaluation about sensory systems, that you let them know that what your concerns are that you talked about. And this is going to be true for every professional you go to, even the audiologist. You're going to tell them about the behaviors you see, about the social interaction, about the, the language that they use now, about the things that they don't, because the more information you as a parent take with you to see these professionals, the better the results are you're going to get from them. Again, you know your child best if you've done steps one and two and you really understand what, how to, you know, what's going on and what ticks with your child and where the holes are and where the problems are, then those professionals are going to thank you, thank you, thank you, because they're going to look great because they're going to be able to pull out the right knowledge to help you. But when they have to solve the problem from the ground up and they don't know your child like you do, then it's not going to be as successful an experience for you as a family working with that practitioner. So the more information you can take with you that's concise, that's why if you look at each of these bullet points that I put here, and um, I have done a, a developmental evaluation um, 
thing before video before to talk about that but this is again how do, how you're going to find things not just about developmental about general about everything so no matter why your child is late talking using this three-step method you'll be able to figure it out okay eventually so then what happens is you need to check the sensory systems with those things um and then you can also investigate use your um your early intervention system, if your child is under three, they'll do a free evaluation for you, either in your home or in some local clinic or something like that, where they'll test those five areas and they will talk about the, they'll, you know, do standardized testing with the, um, with those um, areas, the self-help, the, the, you know, and they might alert you to some things that were challenging for you to see. So those professionals, I used to do these evaluations, you know, multiple times a week um, where we sat down with families to help them understand where those holes are. And then, of course, they can make recommendations about services for you. So early intervention is good. If your child's older than three, then you're going to have to piecemeal it together and find someone there, you know, who can do that sort of evaluation for you. But you have to really think about what you're going to get from that evaluation tool because those early intervention evaluations, they might tell you that your child's at XYZ level, but that doesn't tell you why they're having the problem. The point of finding the root cause is to find out why this problem exists. And sensory systems can cause that problem and you're gonna find sensory doctors or professionals who test them. And these are professionals who test these things. You're gonna find testers first. So vision and hearing sensory testers. You're going to find learning and evaluation testers. And that can be early intervention professionals. It can be speech and language therapists, OTs, you know, autism specialists, things like that. As long as you are getting real information about how your child learns from that evaluation. You don't just want standard scores or how he compares to other kids. You want to know details about the things your child uses to learn. Is he a visual learner? Is he an auditory learner? Does he like to play with toys? Does he not? How do I get him to like to play with toys? You know, all of that kind of stuff you want to know. Now, you also can work with doctors. If you suspect toxins, you can work with doctors who do the kind of testing, hair testing, blood testing, fecal testing, urine testing, to identify if there are toxic problems. I don't ever recommend people try introducing supplements like B vitamins or fish oils or things like that. There are protocols that exist that people have done with studies that work for some families and not others, but it all, all the families who I communicate with in my program and, and here on Facebook and all over actually, who have been the most successful with biomedical intervention, work with doctors who do testing frequently and they give those methods um, you know, recommendations for using intervention that meets that chemical issue that's going on with the child. There's no haphazard about it. You wouldn't just throw pharmaceuticals at your child. You shouldn't do it with any other kind of medicine either. And the same goes for diet. Um, you know, diet has a big, big issue about, th about kids, but it may not even be so much the um, the natural ingredients that even the genetically modified it's the, it's the way that it's been taken care of right so so gluten may not even be bad for your child but the because the only gluten you've been giving them is processed bread they're having trouble with gluten so you have to really get testing to understand what's going on and it might not be the gluten it might be the additives it might be the dyes it might be the dairy it might be you know whatever or it could be that you, your child doesn't have difficulty with these dietary issues at all and then you know, but you have to get testing with doctors and nutritionists who understand these mechanisms before you go haphazardly trying those things. Always get real information that makes sense to you and applies to like, how is this diet change going to help my child with their behavior issues? How is this 
um, intervention with biomedical, you know, with supplements or whatever, going to help my child with their sensory motor, you know, not just late talking, because remember all of those other things, how is it going to help with attention? How's it going to help with comprehension? How's it going to help with social interaction? How is this intervention going to help my child with those things? Those are the questions you need to be asking your providers when you see them. Um, and then after you've looked at your child's wellness, their social skills, their self-help, you've done evaluations to get to all those things, that's when you can start to get real um, clarity about the kind of intervention that you want to use for your child. So. Remember, you have to understand why they're late talking in the first place. And it's not just because they have a diagnosis. You have to, have to, have to dig deeper. And you have to understand what it is about all of these systems, because any one of these systems that gets off track can sort of break down the whole rest of the language learning process. So it's very, very important that you look at all those systems. And sometimes through life, it's different systems. So I have a family in my program, bless their heart, they have a little girl who had tongue tie problems, ear problems, and, um, and vision problems that weren't identified until she was older than five years old because her behaviors were so significant and they were automatically sent down a behavior intervention standpoint before they did the physiological evaluation that I talked about here, before they started looking at the systems. And when they started looking at each individual systems, that's when they uncovered that their poor little girl couldn't see and she also couldn't move her mouth well enough to, to you know, say words. And here they were trying to facilitate this mom, bless her heart. She's a teacher. She's been doing amazing work trying to teach her child all kinds of things. And her child has learned tons of things. And she's improved her behavior and she's improved her communication. But she didn't see real improvement in speech and language until these physiological issues were done. And now she has a new daughter who's doing amazing new communication and trying hard and they have a super bright future. And are they done yet? No, but they're constantly doing the, you know, looking and this, these moms are constantly back in steps one and two, understanding what is it that's breaking down about my child's communication because they're taking on the job to help their kids learn to facilitate language themselves. So the next step, once you learn these things and you find professionals who you can trust is you have to find intervention that's going to address the specific problems that you're having. So if it's attention, if it's focus, if it's um, relating to other people, if it's accessing and using words, if it's understanding vocabulary, whatever those breakdowns are, a speech and language pathologist can help you identify where in the language learning process your child is broken down. So when you go to a speech and language pathologist for an evaluation, you need to make sure that they're not just giving you numbers and they're not just comparing your child to other kids, that they are giving you details about how your child is or where, it, where it's breaking down and you know get the intervention that's going to help address those breakdown areas because you can't teach vocabulary on top of doing other things. And the best way for a speech pathologist to help you is if you use them as a resource, okay? And so what I'm gonna do tomorrow in my language facilitation resources group is my tip of the week video is going to be specifically about how to use your speech and language pathologist if you have an early intervention person, if you're working with someone at a clinic, if someone comes to your home, you know, if you have a speech pathologist that's working with you now, I'm going to give you tips on how to use that speech pathologist as a resource, make them look great, make them and offer them the 
opportunity to help you help your child because the only way your child is going to your lay talker is going to start using natural communication is if you are doing language facilitation at home so if you're not in my language facilitation resources group every week I put a tip of the week video in there where I give demonstrations on actual strategies that I coach to parents who I work with that will show them how to show you how to do language facilitation with your child and on this video tomorrow sort of a piggyback for this video I'm going to be talking about exactly how you can um, work with your speech pathologist so that you know what to do to help your child at home and maximize their language facilitation opportunities so that's um, that's what's going to happen tomorrow morning in my language facilitation group I will put the link to that group in the details of this video so you can go ahead and join there if you're watching it on my page here on Facebook you can go to the top and click the join group button that will also take you over to the group there's just a couple questions for you to answer one being how serious are you as a parent in teaching your child how to use words because it is takes parents to do it parents must take on this responsibility you can't be a fix my kid mom you have to um, do the work yourself and this language facilitation group really helps parents now if you have been working with a speech pathologist or you don't have one available to you and you are interested in knowing more about working with me in my lifetime waves of communication program I help parents teach their kids how to use words no matter what's going on in your life and it's a lifetime program so we ride all the waves of communication if you want to know more about that you can send me a private message or you can visit my website, wavesofcommunication.com, and learn all the details about that. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for joining me today. I see a bunch of people joined on, and I really appreciate your attention, and I really appreciate your interest in learning more about how to help your late talker learn to use the words they need, because this is the trick. It's not any kind of newfangled, tricky, you know, it's parents doing language facilitation and it is seeing better results for my families than any time they relied on me to do the therapy when they learned to use me as a resource that's when they really made improvement so that's what the video is about tomorrow thanks again for joining me everybody today and I will see you all on my next live video